This is lecture 18 in BBSP 610. We'll, this will be the first of several discussion of several lectures on regression. As you'll recall, the purpose of regression is to make inferences about two quantitative variables. That is, two numeric variables. We want to know is there a significant association between the two variables? How strong is this association? and can we predict the value of one variable based on the other variable. If you remember the example from the previous lecture, we talked about the speed and stopping distances of cars. That here shows a scatter plot and a straight line approximation to that scatter plot. The idea being that if a car were going about 20 miles per hour, we would predict that it would go about 60 feet once you slammed on the brakes before coming to a complete stop. And today we'll discuss how you would calculate such a regression line and why you would want to. Before we get into that, just a brief review of lines. If you've taken math recently and are comfortable with this, feel free to skip until later in the lecture, but it would be helpful to have a review of lines. I'm going to go over it quickly. The, say there is an amusement park and it costs $10 to get into the amusement park. Every time you go on a ride it costs $3. So the total cost will be $10 plus $3 times the number of rides. So hopefully this is fairly self-explanatory. If you were to make a table showing the total cost versus the number of rides, if you don't go on any rides, it'll cost $10. If you go on one, it's $13. If you go on two, it's $16, etc. And in general, a straight line or a linear function, as it's known, can be modeled as y equals a plus bx. In this case, a the, what's known as the y-intercept is equal to 10, and what's known as b is the slope is equal to 3. Why do we call it that? Well, this next page shows a plot of the total cost versus the number of rides. It's just a graph of the table from the previous slide, and you'll notice it looks linear that for zero rides, it costs ten dollars. One at thirteen, two at sixteen. If you plot those against each other, you get a straight line. That's why it's known as a linear function. You'll notice every unit to the right, you go up three units. That's why you call it a slope. That you're going three units up for every one unit to the right, and you don't really see it in this graph because y doesn't because r doesn't always follow the convention of putting the y-axis at zero, but if there were a y-axis going through x equals zero, then the line would intersect that axis at y equals 10, which is why that 10 is known as the y-intercept. So if you need to find an equation for the line, the first thing you can do is calculate the slope. If you remember from college algebra, the formula for slope is rise over run, or in other words, the change in y divided by the change in x. In the line that we have here, you just choose any two points from the line, take the change in y, 13 minus 10 in this example here, and then the change in x, 1 minus 0, you get 3 for the slope. Once you have the slope, then you solve for the y-intercept using substitution. We know this line goes through the point 1, 13. So you plug in 13 for y, 1 for x, you get y equals a plus 3 times 1. Solve for a, you get the, the y-intercept a is equal to 10. And as I said before, the way you interpret a line is that a 1 unit in x is associated with a b unit increase in a b unit increase in y or b unit decrease in y if b is negative. So in this case, a 1 unit increase in the number of rides associated with a $3 increase in the total cost. So let's say we want to model y based on x using a linear model that going back to the cars example, 
that say we want to predict the stopping distance based on the speed when you jam on the brakes and in some sense we want to find the best possible fitting line to that data set. And the way this is done it conventionally is you try to find a line that minimizes the sum of the squared errors. Well, what do I mean by that? You find a line such that y hat sub i, that's the approximation for y i for the ith observation, is equal to b0 plus b1 times xi, and you choose b0 and b1 to minimize the sum of squared errors, which is the sum of y i hat squared minus y i squared and try to get that as small as possible. Hopefully this next slide will, will give a little better illustration of what's going on here that say the dots represent the points that we're trying to approximate and you can see the line that we're using to approximate them. The difference between the true value of y and the value of y estimated on the line is illustrated on the plot. For example, the, plot, the point furthest to the left when x is about 4.5, it looks like we predict y to be about 2.8 when it's actually about 3. So the difference is 0.2. So the approximation, so the error in this case would be 0.2 and the squared error would be 0.2 squared. So the total sum of squares for this particular regression line would be 0.2 squared plus minus 0.22 squared plus 0.33 squared plus 0.21 squared, etc., etc. And the regression line is chosen to minimize that sum of squared errors across all possible regression lines. If you're curious why we minimize the sum of squared errors, it's just because it's easier to calculate. There are other regression me methods that minimize the sum of the absolute value of the errors or things like that. In practice, they're almost never used because they take specialized software to calculate, whereas it's very easy to calculate the least squares line. In fact, the formula for it is on the next slide. You'll never use this formula. I'll always have you calculate this in R in this class, but if you ever need to know the formula, that's the expression for B1 hat. I'll note that it's just that it's also equal to the covariance of x and y divided by the variance of x, or it can also be written as the correlation coefficient times the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. And if you know beta 1 hat, um, you can calculate beta 0 hat using beta 1 hat and y bar and x bar. In practice, you'll want to calculate this regression line using R. The command that you will use is LM. And like I said, this data set is built into R. It's called CARS if you want to try it yourself. I say LM dist twiddle speed. In this particular data frame, dist is the stopping distance. Speed is the, car, is the speed the car was going when you slam on the brakes. And I'll explain what these numbers below mean later. For the time being, just in terms of how you use the command, y twiddle x is a formula object in R. It tells R that you want to predict y based on x. We've used this for some other things in the past. For the time being, if you have lm y twiddle x, that says to fit a linear regression model to the appropriate formula to predict y based on x. If you add the command data equals data set like I did on the previous slide. That tell that says the y and x should be columns from the data frame called data set, which is useful if your data is in a data frame. Of course, y and x could just be R objects by themselves and not part of a data frame, in which case you wouldn't need the data command. And some other useful functions in R, given a regression object, if you go back a couple slides, you'll note that we saved, that when we fit the regression model, we saved it in a variable called cars.lm.
And the reason I say that is because there's other R functions that you can use to extract useful information from this type of regression model. For example, if you say co of cars.lm, that will give you the y-intercept and the slope of the fitted regression line. If you say fitted cars.lm, that will give you the predicted stopping distance based on the regression line for each value of x in the data set. I guess basically just said this in general, if you say co of, of an lm object, that will return the coefficients of a regression object, that is the output of the lm command. If you say fitted of an lm object, that will return the fitted values of a regression object. In other words, the estimated value of y for each possible value of x. A little terminology here, the error in a regression line for a given observation is called the residual. Formally, it means the difference between the actual value of an observation and the predicted value. And if the regression line is a good fit, then we would expect the residuals to be small with no noticeable patterns. We'll discuss this in more detail here in a few minutes. In R, to calculate the residuals of a regression object, the command is called resid. Here I say resid cars.lm. We get the difference between the true value and the predicted value for each observation or data set. And there are some fairly large residuals here, but most of them are relatively small, indicating the model's a fairly decent fit. And in general, if you say resid of an LM object, that'll give you the residuals. Why do we care about these residuals? Well, if a regression model is quote-unquote correct, the residuals should be completely random. It should just look like a big blob of points. If you see a pattern in the residuals, that may indicate that your regression model is violated and that it may give you inaccurate inferences or inaccurate predictions. And if you see an unusually large residual, that observation might be an outlier. And unfortunately, I won't be able to say much more about this than that. I had some additional material on this, but it got chopped in order to get this class down to a reasonable time limit. If you want more detail, you can console the textbook, or you can email me, and I'm happy to send you some additional materials on this. But how do you make predictions based on a regression line? Once you've calculated a regression line, you may want to make predictions about the value of y for a new value of x. And we can input the new value of y into x with the regression equation. Into the regression equation, just take the estimated regression coefficients, multiply x by b1, add b0, that gets your predicted value of y. So for example, in R, we, have, we know the coefficients for this object are minus 17.58 and 3.93. So if we wanted to predict the stopping distance of a car that's going 21 miles per hour, we could just take 3.93 times 21 minus 17.58. We end up with almost exactly 65 feet. A slightly easier way to do it in R, although with something of a clumsy syntax, you can use the predict command in R. I say predict cars.lm, new data equals data dot frame speed equals 21, and you see I get the same number. Why did I do that clunky interface? Well, in general, in R, if you say predict lm dot object, say new data equals some new data points, then it'll predict then it'll make predictions for lm.object at the points in, in this new data parameter. But it's important to note that it has to be a data frame, which makes the syntax clumsy. If you have a single variable named x and you want to make predictions when x is equal to x0, then you have to say predict lm.object, comma, new data equals data.frame, then parentheses x equals x0. We do multiple regressions, so hopefully make a little more sense for the time being. You can just copy what I've written here if you need to do this for the homework, because I know it's strange. An important issue to keep in mind when you make predictions 
uh, using regression models is this idea of interpolation versus extrapolation. Interpolation means that you're predicting within the range of the x's that you use to fit the model. Extrapolation means that you're predicting outside the range of the x's that you use to fit the model. And as you can see in the picture here, extrapolation can be dangerous. This woman is getting married tomorrow, and so today she has zero husbands, tomorrow she'll have one husband. So if this person wants to extrapolate, see by the end of next month she'll have uh, get, getting close to 50 or 60 husbands. So says so tells her to get a bulk rate on a wedding cake. Well, of course we know in practice that just because you go from zero to one husbands over the course of one day, you're unlikely to go from one to two husbands on the following day and continuing down the line. It's kind of a silly illustration of why extrapolation can be problematic. <coughs> In any event, it's quite common for data have an approximately linear pattern for part of the range of the data, but a different pattern outside that range. If you want to avoid extrapolation whenever possible, and particularly if you're writing a paper, if you do extrapolate, you want to state clearly that you're extrapolating and what assumptions that you're making when you do, when you make the extrapolation. And a few other comments on regression. But if you reverse the x and y, if you reverse x and y and refit the regression model, the you'll get a different regression line. In particular, the slope will be different. It will have the same sign, either positive or negative, but it's hard to say much more beyond that. And the regression line always passes through the point x bar, y bar. Sorry, the bars disappeared on my x and y here. It's all, and as I'll illustrate in the next couple slides, linear regression is not robust. If there's outliers in your data, it can cause major problems. A brief discussion of outliers and influential observations and regression models. Outliers are points that fall outside the overall data distribution, and influential observations are data points that greatly change the regression line if moved. And these are often the same thing, but not necessarily. It's possible to have a point that's an outlier but not influential. It's also possible to have a very influential point that's not an outlier. I'll try to illustrate this in the next couple slides. The main message to take home here is that when you're doing regression, in particular univariate regression, it's always a good idea to graph the data and have some idea of what's going on rather than just mindlessly fitting the model. Because there's some examples of outliers in two-dimensional data with both x and y. The first panel shows something that's an outlier with respect to x, but within the regular range for y. The second panel, it's not an outlier with respect to x, but it is an outlier with respect to x and y. The third panel, it's an outlier with respect to both. The fourth panel, it's an outlier with respect to neither. This fourth panel is kind of important and illustrates why you should always do scatter plots. That if you just plotted a box plot of x and a box plot of y, you wouldn't notice anything unusual in this fourth panel. All the points would be safely within the box plot. But if you plot x and y together, you see that it doesn't fit the pattern of the rest of the data points. And these are the things that you have to watch out for when you fit regression models. Here's some examples of influential observations. The top picture here shows a point that's an outlier but not influential. Just because even though it's an outlier with respect to the rest of the data, it follows the same pattern as the rest of the data, so it doesn't have much of an effect on the regression line. However, if you have something like you see in the bottom panel, that pulls the entire regression line down. So that would be an outlier that is influential. And you have to be careful of these sorts of things when you fit regression models, because you can see there just a single outlier can have a big effect on your model. Outliers can cause big errors when you fit a regression line. You want to always plot the data to identify outliers and remove them if necessary. There's more rigorous ways to do this. I won't go into them this class, 
but if you ever need to do this, you're welcome to get in touch with me and I can give you some additional reading. Well, the things to remember for today is that using regression you can predict you can predict an outcome variable y based on a predictor variable x. Extrapolating is dangerous and regression is not robust against outliers. R commands to remember LM to fit a regression object and COA fitted in resid to extract various pro or various numbers associated with the model and predict to make predictions based on this regression model.